Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Sunday Stream. We are on episode 21, and today I am joined by my good friend and one of the earliest people I've interacted with on YouTube, Mr. David Carlson, also known as DC Perspective. David, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I love this part of the channel and the episodes that we do, so I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, I was... um. I was talking to someone who who works in the foreign policy world personally, and he was like, "Yeah, I was just because I told the group chat, I was like, I'm gonna be on this guy's stream. You guys should watch." And he was like, "I was just watching his foreign policy stuff. It's really good." And I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, I discovered the Prudentialist. I actually don't know how we met. I met. I so I heard of you because you showed up on Don the Pleb stream one day." And I was like, I like this kid. And you said all the things that I had liked. So I was like, I'm going to shoot this guy a message. And I, you were on Twitter. And so this all worked out. Mm, yes. I mean, Who's no the one... kid? That's not Turnip? Of course. Come on, man. If, if it were Turnip, we'd be sounding the exact same. Exactly. I don't have the the, the new age millennial speak like you guys do. <laughs> Prudentialist puppeteers from the shadows. No, not really. Uh, but as we wait for everyone to pour in, uh, so just I'll do my usual housekeeping at the beginning, and then we'll go from there and get started. Um, so there's going to be a lot of stuff coming up in the coming weeks ahead. I'm going to be uploading my uh, wonderful time I had on the Fed post from a few weeks ago. So that'll be like two hours of goodness for you guys. You guys are very blessed for that. And then it'll be... Uh, accompanied with some footage that I've been recording on OBS. So you get to see how terrible I am playing games at high difficulty. That'll be fun. They, they, the Fed post lets you, um, upload. Yeah. They let Oren do it when they put on his episode and they're already like two episodes ahead. So they, I asked them before even, so I'll be uploading. I don't know if I'm going to upload the whole thing, but That's cool. it'll be uh, quite a bit. It'll be fun. Cause it was a nice time talking to like populist, like lefty types. So there was a lot of overlap, but at the same time that, divide between the materialist and spiritualist is uh always a fun time to talk about it yeah Fanami, i know and i'm going to hold my tongue on that issue and we'll just carry on from there um but anyways uh with that being said there's a lot of stuff in the works and i'm very happy that things are going out uh i'm glad that you all showed up for the real talk stuff it was really nice to actually go fishing again for the first time and meanwhile, David's got his lovely APU sign behind him. He's been very busy as well. I ha Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's been a while since I've been on the channel. Maybe it has been. Now. It's been a long time. It has. I've missed it. Yeah. But today we get to talk about a very fun topic because lately Mr. Buchanan has been trending on Twitter and in commentaries all around. So I thought that it would be fun for us to have this conversation talking about, you know, the paleo conservative, the ever so popular viewpoints of Mr. Pat Buchanan, the most uh, important politician in American politics who everyone owes an apology, and uh, that of Henry Kissinger. Um, so both of these men have worked in the Nixon White House, and both have been providing commentary on foreign policy as long as they've been alive. So yeah. what a greater time to talk about their differing views on, you know, Nixon's detente on China and their differing visions for the world. So, uh, I think it's important for us to start today by just talking about their little bit of a background. Um, David, I know that you wanted to cover uh, Pat Buchanan first. I know that you were more oriented to talk about him than Nixon. So if you wanted to start off and go from there. Well, yeah, back when we first discussed this, I was like, I knew very little about Henry Kissinger. Um, but I've been doing a lot of reading and I think that they're both like very interesting individuals and they're both clearly super intelligent and have a good uh, grasp of their own worldview. And so Pat, Pat Buchanan and, and Pat Buchanan is specifically important because he basically encapsulates what most of the right wing online dissident thought is when it comes to foreign policy. And I think if you properly understand where he's coming from, and the confusing kind of almost contradicting um, nature that he's been seen as throughout all of his time in public life, you'll probably understand where most right-wingers are coming from when they talk about foreign policy. It's important to talk about both of their pasts as well because they're both very similar to their personalities. And I was just telling Prudentialists before we started here that 
Henry Kissinger and Pat Buchanan, their foreign policy is very heavily reflected in their characteristics, in their personality. So Pat Buchanan was born and raised um, in and to a Southern Catholic family. Uh, so he was raised in Washington, D.C. He saw uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower and Nikita Khrushchev on in D.C. when uh, Nikita Khrushchev famously came to D.C. in the 50s, I believe, and with you know the open convertible. And he was in the crowd of people standing there cheering on Dwight D. Eisenhower. Um, he's a rambunctious person. He had to learn how to fight from the beginning. He had to learn how to how to live in a Protestant town as a Catholic, as an Irish Catholic. Uh, so there's a lot of personal like traits in Pat Buchanan that um, that are reflected in his his foreign policy views and probably his domestic views too. But that's for another time. And, and that is that he's a, he's he's honest and he's very he's very headstrong and convicted, and he believes what he says. Right. So when he talks about the seriousness of the culture wars and his famous like um, in his famous Republican National Convention speech from 92 or whatever or 88, this this conversation where he's like declaring a culture war against the Clintons and the Democrat Party, calling them the party of mass abortion and mass immigration and corporate oligarchy and whatever, like all this really base stuff for the, especially for the nineties. Um, it's reflected in his, in his politics as well. So he's very courageous and in his foreign policy as well. And so we saw that with like the Nixon summit in the Mao Nixon summit, and I'm probably getting too far ahead here, but he absolutely hated it because he recognized that having a commun communication to the degree at which they did with communist China, being friends with Mao um, and Mao's little buddies and the murderous dictator that was like in the process of killing millions and millions of people uh, while fighting a war in Vietnam against the same you know, faction of people committing those evil atrocities. He recognized that for what it was, and that was a moral failure on the part of Americans, you know, give, coming along and getting buddy-buddy with the co godless communists. Whereas Kissinger, he is kind of scheming. He's Machiavellian. He's a realist. He grew up um, in Germany in the 30s as a Jew in Bavaria. He had to flee, uh, I think, in, in 37, I think is when he left Bavaria. And he grew up in New York. And he grew up as a conservative in a liberal hive mind. And so everybody was an FDR Democrat. They all loved FDR growing up. And he didn't. He was a Republican. Uh, hard to believe. Um, but he was. And so he learned kind of how to move in that circle. He's a megalomaniac, Henry Kissinger is. Oh, he's yeah. A, and he's a genius. Um, and this maneuvering with the in the liberal circles, he went to Harvard. He became he got tenure at Harvard. He interacted with Rockefeller, uh, or Rockefeller, um, <laughs> the the governor of New York, and and helped him on his presidential ambitions. But and then he hopped to the Nixon White House, which was he admits all the time that Nixon was his least favorite Republican politician. But yet they got along very well because Henry Kissinger was an impatient genius that understood how to buddy up with people. And in uh, Washington, go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, I was going to say, I wonder how much of that hatred though comes from his domestic policy, just because of how much influence Moynihan had on domestic issues. The, the Supreme Uber liberal at the time. I, you mean, yeah, well, I think Kissinger wasn't ever really that concerned with domestic policy to tell you the truth. Uh, in, well, I mean, so this is some fun stuff about Kissinger. So Kissinger and uh, Nixon's administration are very PR oriented um, to a point where people who worked within the uh, press corps for Nixon's administration had described uh, Henry Kissinger as this evolution of three ways. I'm not really a media guy, so I'm going to let you guys do it. To eventually transitioning to, I'm not a PR media guy, but let me tell you how I would do it. Um, so it concerns on domestic issues on how to sell them were something of a concern of Kissinger to the White House press corps and the press secretary. Uh, but at the same time, him and Nixon would constantly buffer each other's egos going back and forth, 
talking about their foreign policy accomplishments as these great historical things, talking about their meeting in China as to be like one of the most important things for the American foreign policy since like the end of the Second World War, Kissinger upping the ante saying it's the greatest thing for American diplomacy in American history since the end of the Civil War. So there's a lot of back and forth feeding within each other's egos. But I think what, like we were talking about before we went live, was that one of the greatest differences between Kissinger and uh, Buchanan is their willingness to deal with their ideology and their principles. If anyone will know this, is that simply that um, I've always been able, I think Buchanan has been the most consistent in his principles throughout his political career. He has been, you know, a staunch American, you know, primacy kind of guy, a staunch American retrenched, we don't need to be across all over the world a very sort of anti-imperialist sort of viewpoint, a very strong aspect of the old American right, ranging back from the time of Mark Twain commenting about the adventurism of like Theodore Roosevelt and others, um, and McKinley too. So to me, whereas Kissinger is far more amenable to being willing to negotiate, willing to look past sort of the American principles. And once we dive into China in, in just a minute here, like the greatest divide, of course, is that Kissinger recognizes that, you know, in these private meetings, I can speak frankly, but publicly, I am constrained by the more hardened anti-communists within, you know, this administration's party. And he laments that both during Nixon and Ford's administration. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about Nixon and Kissinger, like, aggrandizing one another regarding the Mao summit. Kissinger, even read anything about Kissinger's biography, is he hated Nixon in the White House, too. He lied to his face. I mean, he would, like, build Nixon up, and then as soon as the door was closed, he was out of the meeting, or he'd put down the phone, he'd talk to his staffers about what a madman he was, or a bumbling idiot, or some just... I mean, Henry Kissinger in um, in in the White House was known as Henry Ass Kissinger. Like I, <laughs> like, I said that to the Prudentialists in a group chat, and that was I didn't come up with that. Um, I'm not original enough, even though that's not very hard, I guess. But it became a it became a pastime of people in Washington D.C. to discuss what lies Henry Kissinger was telling to people. Uh, so he would just play the most opposites off of one another. So he'd go and he'd he'd have dinner with Buckley Buckley Jr. pretty regularly, um, or William F. Buckley from New York. And then William F. Buckley would go home and talk about how, oh, wow, you know, Henry Kissinger is the best person that we have in the White House, and, and he's going to keep Nixon straight. And then he'd go have dinner with some liberal professor from Georgetown or Harvard, and the Georgetown liberal professor would go home to his wife and go, wow, Henry Kissinger is the best liberal, most progressive person we have in the White House. He's going to keep Nixon like off of the you know nuclear war with China or whatever, or uh, I guess Russia was the bigger problem than in the Soviet Union. And so people quickly kind of figured out that, okay, this guy's a two-faced liar. And there's a great anecdote in one of uh, Buchanan's books about this. So they were swimming at some event, uh, probably in Europe or something, and they were at a pool. And Henry Kissinger came and popped up under the water and, and speaking to Buchanan was like, wow, James Burnham is just really right, isn't he? I've been reading those James Burnham articles. and he's Spot on the money, right on the money or whatever. And James Burnham at the time was predicting Western collapse and all of these, you know, uh, talking about the bureaucracy, the managerial elite, um, talking hardline paleoconservative clearly doesn't even really agree with Kissinger. And Kiss Kissinger was partly doing this in jest, but it was also like kind of shows how, how willing Kissinger was to lie, lie to people just to be, in the position where he might have some influence and it worked too, especially during the Nixon white house. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing is, is that when we talk about sort of the self, you know, aggrandizement and the ego of it all, I mean, um, there was an article I was reading prepping for this stream. Cause I, as someone who grew, you know, is in the realist school, Kissinger does play a large influence with that sort of real politique, but there's always when it comes to I think White House stuff is I my view of it is always that there's some sort of ego driven aspect of it. Everyone who works in that kind of field equals um, some kind of, you know, we're all driven by ambition and, you know, documents around Kissinger, you know, their article I was reading was that 
And I'll just read it off. So, quote, Kissinger's main criticism of President Nixon was directed against those who surrounded him. He had said, I have never met such a gang of self-seeking bastards in my life. Um, to the letter, he continued, when I observed that the same criticism had been leveled against other national leaders and perhaps this sort of thing was always said, he replied, uh, Kissinger replied, no, I used to find that the Kennedy group unattractively narcissistic, but they were idealists. These people are just real heels, end quote. Um, so, I'm, but I mean, I think that happens anytime, but you're trying to, to concentrate power and to put in your own stuff because the cornerstone of Henry Kissinger, especially when it comes to his level of influence is taking away influence from the department of state and putting it more so towards the national security council. Um, I mean, at the beginning of Nixon's administration, and I put this quote out on Twitter in a conversation with Henry Kissinger, you know, he's talking about sort of the policy limitations that he can get done both on foreign and domestic issues and richard nixon has says you know we checked and found out that 96 percent of the bureaucracy are against us they're bastards that are here to screw us in which henry kissinger agreed i think that that richard nixon quote's just as important about his uh, other famous quote about the press being the enemy um so i mean henry kissinger and you know aggrandizing his own power and centralizing it and his influence at the time is moving a lot of the power away from the Department of State towards the National Security Council. So when things start moving about getting towards to China and having those meetings and having those dialogues either through Pakistan or attempts to meet in Denmark with you know Chinese officials through mutual friends, um, it's all done through the National Security Council. It's not done through the Department of State. And in the 1971 you know meetings that uh, Kissinger has before Nixon comes over famously in the year after, um, it's all NSC staff. It's all led by Kissinger and Winston Lord and Holdridge and those who went with them. It's not the State Department at all. Yeah, they spent a lot of time in the early formative Nixon White House, like months and years, just cleaning up um, and, and accumulating power in the White House when it comes to foreign policy. And and Buchanan went into the... Um, into the presidency with this in mind, very specifically, he didn't want a um, a Pentagon-led foreign policy, but a White House-led, and the National Security Council is a part of that. And there's a lot of power games. I know one of the assistant secretary um, to Kissinger actually got him the job, basically in the Nixon White House, and then I think within like four months, Nick or Kissinger had maneuvered to give him such a workload, cutting him off from Nixon entirely, um, making him do a lot of busy work that he resigned within one to four months or something like this. And so Nixon was very, very Machiavellian and scheming constantly. And we and this is reflected in the foreign policy, especially with the you know secret bombings in Cambodia and even more so in the the secret, you know, trips to China that were taken and how everything was very hush hush in the Nixon White House when it came to foreign policy. Yeah, and I mean, and like you had said, he got in there because living up to his name about, you know, kissing ass, like, <laughs> you know, he supports Rockefeller during the 1968 um Republican primary. You know, he calls Nixon the most dangerous men to be running for president. Um, and he's upset that Nixon wins the primary, which I mean, we should, one of these days we should probably do a prudent reads on like the greatest comeback and just talk about the 68 and the, uh, 72 elections. But, um, I mean, as soon as that's done, right. <laughs> Kissinger calls Richard Allen, one of the campaign aides for the Nixon campaign and just says he will do anything to help Nixon win and eventually gets appointed as the national security advisor for the administration. Yeah. And, um, a part of that doing anything, and he was playing the Humphrey camp and the Nixon camp off of one another. Cause Kissinger was like, Oh, I have, I have a guy inside of the, um, inside the peace talks going on in France regarding Vietnam right now. Uh, here's, here's the T. And then he turned around to the Humphrey camp and, uh, Samuel Huntington, who was an advisor to hum Humphrey at the time, who was also a Harvard uh, professor, which Kissinger also was. He, they both had a house in uh, Martha's, Martha's Vineyard, I believe, 
or vineyard or whatever. And he'd go over there and he'd talk to Huntington and be like, I want to help Humphrey win. You know, here's what's up. So he was, he's always playing these people off of each other. And frankly, I don't know whether to be more shocked or like amused that it worked for so long and that he was, you know, even in 27 or 2018, when Donald Trump was having a spat with Rex Tillerson, right? When Rex Tillerson left, he was consulting Henry Kissinger. Like he was talking to Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger had a voice on the world stage. He was a member of the Atlantic Council or on the board of the Atlantic Council, which arguably is like a huge board. But then there's a lot of people on it. So that's not very special, you know. But like this guy influenced everybody. You know, the last White House he worked in was Ford's. And that's because he became like the bubonic plague for Republicans. The right wing hated this guy. Uh, but, you know, still his his power, his ability to just like rub shoulders. When he was in Harvard, he started a Harvard uh, like newsletter or pu uh, publication. And he did it solely for the purpose of accumulating contacts, which he was using up until like the early 2000s, forming the coalition for Bush and, and in the 90s, um, you know, in the private life. So these, his ability to, to manipulate people is astounding. Oh, yeah. And I mean, his close relationship has existed long after Nixon, and we can get into that in the future um, in this conversation. But I think now is a good time to to begin to transition towards the views that both Nick Kissinger and Buchanan have had in regards to China. Um, so some, for, for some clarification, right, so to, to draw the, you know, the state of the world come 1971. So China has, of course, fallen. Uh, the civil war, Chiang Kai-shek loses in 1949, flees to Taiwan. Um, communist China becomes a thing in 1949. And there's been more or less 20 some odd years of uh, mutual isolation between the United States and uh, the uh, People's Republic of China. And to a point where, you know, things are taken to a very personal and diplomatic note. I remember um, there's a comment that uh, Cho and Lai makes to Kissinger about, you know, we take things very personally around here. I remember when, uh, the, you know, one of the Dulles brothers refused to shake our hand at a meeting in Europe. Um, secondly, it's important to, to recognize that the United States and China had tried to have official negotiations ongoing since 1955 to sort of facilitate conversations and diplomacy that had gotten nowhere. Um, the American approach was always about the little things and try and work our way closer towards the bigger issues, such as Korea, Indochina, Vietnam, um, our relationship with Japan, and of course, the issue with the American treaty with Chiang Kai-shek and the promise to defend Taiwan from the communists. Um, and so all of these issues become, you know, they culminate. So eventually, uh, you know, Nixon and Kissinger, of course, are working together in the White House. And there's, this, you know, we're changing the process of American foreign policy. Um, we are abandoning the Truman Doctrine of containment. Our idea is to try and create something that's known oftentimes as linkage, which is the idea of linking sort of political matters with military matters between the United States and the Soviet Union. And this is on top of the fact that in the, starting around 1960 or so, we get the infamous Sino-Soviet split over various interpretations of uh, Marxist-Leninism um, because Nikita Khrushchev takes power after Stalin dies has this lovely speech warning about the cult of personality. We have to de-Stalinize. We have to take things differently uh, to which the Chinese are like, well, this isn't necessarily right. This isn't the appropriate interpretation of uh, Leninism. And so there's sort of this uh, ideological back and forth. But throughout the 1960s, in addition to this, this is compounded by various border clashes between the Soviet Union and the Chinese on Russia's uh, easternmost part of its borders to a point where it almost culminates in an all-out war in 1969, but thankfully things calm down. So uh, the, the stage is set, and of course um, you get Winston Lord and Henry Kissinger and other members of the National Security Council, Holbridge as well. Um, you know, they start having these dialogues. They eventually get to meet with uh, Cho and Lai, no Mao at this time, and they uh, take a flight in the middle of the night out of uh, Pakistan, out of Islamabad, and fly into China. And that's when the conversation really begins to develop. And this is where we really start seeing that ideological and principle divide between Buchanan and Kissinger. Because one of the first things that gets brought up, of course, is Taiwan. And Kissinger has no problem agreeing with the um, historical Chinese assumption that Taiwan has been a long part of, you know, mainland China for over a thousand years. 
Um, you know, this is a consequence of the end of the Second World War. Uh, we do not necessarily recognize the legitimacy of your treaty with Chiang Kai-shek. And to which Kissinger is more than amenable to making that sort of concession in comparison yeah. to, say, someone like Buchanan or the traditional establishment foreign policy that we see both on the left and the right here in the U.S. even today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it really led, like, Buchanan was asking the question, what did we get out of it? This whole time, you know, what did we get out of this? So he was amenable to, to changing and frankly, abandoning Chiang Kai-shek when Nixon was famously like the only politician in D.C. that he trusted really in the at least in the Eisenhower administration and especially in the Kennedy administration. Chiang Kai-shek famously didn't, was very skeptical of these these young um, aristocratic, you know, Ivy League scholars or whatever, the ones running the Kennedy White House. And <clears throat> and so Buchanan was forced to ask, well, what are we getting out of this? You know, what 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 is the point? And the way that Kissinger was coming at it was this like, you know, every move is on the chessboard. This is he viewed he viewed geopolitics as a as a game between superpowers um, always and, and nothing else. The rising and the fall of superpowers and. Buchanan viewed it more as a moral problem, as a moral fight, as an ideological fight. Um, and that's where we see a big divergence in this like willing to uh, this willingness to appease the Chinese. And my, I, I kind of have a question for you, if you have any comment on this. Why do you think Kissinger was so eager to to do this, to talk to the to talk to China, to, to make this communique, um, to have Richard Nixon visit China? And the Soviet Union, the first president to ever do that as well. That kind of goes not talked about often. Well, to keep in mind, right, so this is a policy change towards detente. So the idea was is that the United States would have something known as triangular diplomacy. This is really meant to um, sort of contain the ideological and also sort of the military readiness of the Soviet Union in the wake of the Sino-Soviet split. So by normalizing ties with China, engaging with trade, trying to open up the two respective countries to each other for both diplomatic economic reasons and communicate, you are cutting off the second largest, you know, or actually the largest in terms of population, but you're, you're, you're cutting off that main bridge between the uh, Soviets and the Chinese. Um, and I mean, that bridge was already heavily, you know, crumpled, of course, but it shows a in a way primarily to sort of keep the Soviet Union contained in, in the hopes that maybe, you know, with this angle and as well as with our linkage policy of trying to get, um, you know, less interventions in conflicts in the third world, whether it's the um, Ethiopia-Somalia conflict, whether it's the war in Angola or some other conflicts that come up, I think, um, uh, within the African continent that the Soviets were involved in. Um, and hopefully try to get concessions about arms and military presence throughout the world. This wasn't necessarily successful, but this was the attempted policy. Now, in regards to, say, making concessions or going about this, I mean, foreign policy always, you know, you have to look out for the national interest. The United States had been in that region now for quite some time. We can go as far back as Eisenhower about the issues ranging in Indochina, which was a significant issue that um, Kissinger and later Nixon would talk about in their meetings with Cho Enlai and Mao. Um, so there's a lot in there that tells us the reason why they were so amenable to this is not only to sort of keep the Soviets on two fronts, but also to decrease tensions in the region and secure American interests in the um, Pacific do you do you think that it was the best way to go about doing it? I mean, I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? But sure. at the at, at the time, if I were to be transported back to nineteen seventy one, and I'm talking to Henry Kissinger about trying to normalize relations with the PRC as you know a method to you know, because obviously containment did not work, right? Like you know, we had two disastrous wars in Vietnam and Korea where there is no real American victory, at least ideologically, right? Um, we can talk about, you know, ratios on, you know, how much damage was done, what, how many tons of bombs were dropped. But I mean, things happen in, um, 
you know, the 38th parallel with uh, Korea. I mean, Saigon falls in 75, right? So uh, containment obviously didn't work. I think the fact is, is that you have one of the most populous and also a nuclear armed state that you haven't talked to for like 20 years. I think that you do need to open up relations. And the fact that there's already a, an ideological and political divide between them and the Soviet Union, I, I would have engaged in it. Yeah, probably. Now, yeah. as many of people have pointed out accurately since then, um, you know, we see after um, Cho and Lai, we, we see sort of this liberalization uh, within China. And we see then the sort of, which is which happens to just perfectly coincide, right, with the um, emerging neoliberal economic policy that comes from the right under Reagan and what follows shortly afterwards from everyone else. Uh, so we kind of in this way, in the long run, kind of help um, China grow. Uh, and of course, that would be your main criticism, right, is that this enables the Chinese to have a much wider international influence. It allows them to have a much greater presence on the world stage economically. But at the time, you know, you just watched the last couple of administrations. So you just watched LBJ and Nixon engage in disastrous conflicts, almost brought the world to nuclear holocaust with Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, I would try to approach things a little more diplomatically, and I can see why they would do that. Um, right. With hindsight being 2020, though, I think that there's a lot more that we could have done definitely to maybe contain this rising power. But also the other thing to keep in mind, right, is who was the greater economic concern during the 80s and 90s as things begin to grow with China? We're more focused on Japan. Yeah. So, I mean, hell, I even George Friedman wrote this huge book back in the 90s about this alleged coming war with Japan, which was a, a, an atrocious prediction because it just showed you a lot of the establishment view at the time. It's like, oh shit, China, uh, Japan's this really rising economic power, uh, but no one somehow managed to predict that they would be dealing with a massive economic problem that they've yet to recover from in the 90s onward. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I can see why they did it. Here's a good question. Do you think that containment would have worked if we used the Douglas MacArthur option? Um, so Douglas MacArthur's option during the Korean War... Probably not, because one, I mean, the Soviets have the bomb by this time. I believe, when did the Chinese get the bomb? The same time they took over, right? 49? Or a little bit later? Let me confirm. It, it, had to, it could not have been 49. No. Uh, they got it in, let me take a look. Hold on. I, I can just like look it up. 63. Right? Uh, probably in the 60s. Yeah, 64. So the Chinese got the bomb in, in the 60s. So you probably could have gotten away with it. I The problem, though, with that um, question about containment working if we use nuclear weapons is you only want to use nuclear weapons. The only time that that really would have worked is if you used it anywhere between 1945 and then the time that the Rosenbergs handed the secrets over yeah. um, when you had pure supremacy in that area. I don't advocate for that because that uses the precedent for other powers that get the nuclear weapon to start using it. And for ecological you know, points and everything like that, I wouldn't want that to happen. So yeah, sure. Right. Nor normalizing could have worked, but I don't... I mean, containment could have worked, but at a very disastrous precedent that I can't in good conscience advocate for, either from a morality stance or a uh, foreign policy position. Kissinger's rise to fame, and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about that, the question that the commenter brought up, was a book he wrote um, in collaboration with a lot of influencers from Harvard and a lot of military generals and such, was on limited nuclear warfare. And it was a theory book that ran about... 400 pages, I think. And he released it. And most theory books of that type don't really get much press play or anything. This book blew up. It was a top seller, bestseller for like 14 weeks straight. It was on limited nuclear use and how to use it precisely and, and to basically advocating for precision strikes with nuclear bombs. And now obviously later in his career, Kissinger changed his mind and probably came to like a similar conclusion like you just espoused. But it's an interesting idea that this escalation could have could have stopped at nuclear weapons and that we could have used it and that it could have worked. And, and this is what Kissinger was saying, basically. Um, I, I don't know. It made me question. It made me like listening to listening and reading about it made me question whether like limited nuclear strikes could have been effective. But I, I think I think you're basically right. As long as the Soviets had nuclear weapons, there was really no no way to not escalate conflict in that regard. And also talking about 
a precision nuclear strike. I mean, uh, in in the 50s and 60s specifically. Yeah, right. <laughs> There's nothing precise about it. Um, you know, nowadays with like tomahawks, it would be easier, but still very difficult. Yeah. So, so that, yeah, that's where I come from when it comes to like containment. Would it have worked with the MacArthur option? Probably, probably as well as it would have worked without the MacArthur option, just with a lot of dead, a lot more dead bodies. Sorry, I'm just replying to someone who added me here on the, in the comments. Um, but no, so with that being said, right, like the other thing to talk about with the differences between these two is also where they, where they come to be involved. Buchanan's been intimately involved with Nixon since prior to his run for president in 68. Um, he talks about it in, uh, is, is the first hired aide, I believe in 1966, he was the opposition research guy. He was known as the inside man and would later be promoted to one of his speech writers. I mean, He's Buchanan's famous for a lot of things. We get the phrase the silent majority from him. We get a lot of, you know, prominent aspects of both Nixon's rhetoric, but also just things that get used all the time in the American right to this day. The, um, the animus between the White House, the Republican Party and, and the press really comes from, you know, obviously Nixon always hated the press, but it really got started with Agnew. And, and Buchanan wrote most of those speeches that Agnew gave about um, the Ford Foundation and about the media, which was a really big issue uh, during, the, during the Nixon White House. In fact, it got so bad that um, they had to put a leash on Agnew again. So even Buchanan was like, OK, this has gone far, far enough, um, you know, PR speaking, public relations speaking. And, and so, yeah, sorry, I just had to comment on that too oh no i mean like nixon right has been infamously dogged on the press even before running for president back in in 68 i the the infamous last press conference when he failed to run for governor and california went blue in a traditionally red state at the time which tells you really how far america's fallen um where he just lambasts them for the press. He thinks like one guy out of the entire crowd for pretty much writing down everything he said fairly. Um, so, I mean, that animus with the media, Nixon's administration had long before um, Buchanan came on. But no, you're absolutely right there. Um, but now, I mean, so that meeting takes place in 1971. Nixon makes the announcement towards um, the end of that year. You know, he's like, this is being broadcasted simultaneously. Um, you know, we've been graciously, you know, invited, we're going to, you know, we're going to come over. And of course, um, you know, Pat Nixon comes with him. Uh, the NSC, some members of the state department come in 1972. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is the normalization of relations. This is the conversations over a variety of issues, um, trying to bring down the drawdown of violence in, uh, Vietnam, which of course, at the same time, we're bombing Cambodia as this is happening. And, of course, the Taiwan issue is brought up, but I mean, the promises or the claims made by Kissinger kind of sort of dominate the conversation. You're limited by party politics domestically here in the United States, but at the same time, you know, we won't say anything too publicly about American support or American forces being involved. This dramatically changes after the Ford and Nixon years where we do make more open promises about being, you know, defending Taiwan, recognizing Taiwanese sovereignty. So, I, and I mean, from there, that really shows the the longstanding, you know, historical factors that play into these two differing views in foreign policy. I mean, Kissinger's words about, you know, what they're amenable to. Here are issues. Um, let's speak very frankly and openly and uncritically. And from there, I mean, he's much more realistic about the domestic situation and how much that plays a role in conducting foreign policy, whereas Buchanan, of course, is adamantly, you know, stand by my principles or die by them. Yes, and I, 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 I kind of got to disagree with you personally. You were saying that you would open relations with China I guess that's probably true, and, and that's probably the best thing to do to put a deeper wedge into the communist bloc in the East. But I, I take the Pat Buchanan line, which you were just talking about, which was like, you got to stand up for your values. And 
you can't, I guess, separate morality from the geopolitics, right? So I want to read this excerpt that um, Buchanan wrote in his book, Nixon's White House Wars. And this is kind of a long, kind of a long one. So stick with me here. But he said, America was a good country, a godly country. During the Cold War, liberal intellectuals might sneer at the uh, denunciations of godless communism and atheistic communism, not understanding that for millions, if the cause lacks a spiritual and moral dimension, Americans would not sustain it with the blood of their sons. Among the difficulties presidents have had in their rallying support for wars in the Middle East and elsewhere since the end of the Cold War is that country has never been convinced that great moral issues are at stake. Kissinger disparage the objections of liberals and conservatives alike that we might be betraying old friends or abandoning trusting allies. Because to him, dumping Taiwan to close a deal with the People's Republic of China was worth doing. This was the stuff of history. In the great game of chess, Henry sought to play, morality must not get in the way of trading a bishop for a rook. When President, when President Nixon and Kissinger toasted Mao the Colossus, to an extent they demoralized the war in Vietnam. Parents might ask the question, why should our sons fight and die resisting Asian communism in Vietnam when Kissinger and Nixon are toasting the most mur murderous and malicious of Asian communists in China? The reversal of alliances, the discard of the Republic of China on Taiwan for an entente with Mao may have been brilliant diplomacy, but what is it also said that at the apex of power, this is really just a game of thrones? Bill Buckley, who told me in China, he would not have been surprised if Nixon had risen to toast Alger Hiss, wrote on our return. We have lost, irretrievably, any remaining sense of moral mission in the world. Mr. Nixon's appetite for summit conference in China transformed the affair from a meeting of diplomatic technicians concerned to examine and illuminate areas of common interest into a pageant of moral togetherness, at which Mr. Nixon managed to give the impression, the impression that he was consorting with Marian Anderson, Billy Graham, and Albert Schweitzer. Reagan, a conservative of the heart as well as of the mind, knew in his bones what Henry never appreciated. This is why Reagan wreaked such havoc upon President Ford in the primaries of 1976 in the speeches, some of which I helped write, by denouncing detente with what he would one day call an evil empire and the focus of evil in the world. Reagan rediabolized <laughs> Brezhnev's Soviet empire, remoralized the conflict, and won the Cold War. So Buchanan doesn't even really have a problem with, you know, a lot of the policy, because Henry Kissinger and Pat Buchanan are both realists. But the what happens here is Buchanan has a bigger problem with more with the morality of it and, and and what it means and why it's it's demoralizing the country. And I, you know, I you know, clearly Buchanan valued the moral conflict, but also like the geopolitical conflict, whereas Kissinger was like informed by this great theory of history. He was a scholar and a professor at Harvard, which definitely like influence that whereas Henry K or Pat Buchanan was a journalist and a political consultant which I mean you can see how that has um such a impact on the way they interact with geopolitics you know like Kissinger had a grand view of of history and and the superpower struggle you know like and civilizational struggle you know he he read um he read uh Spangler pretty closely and I know they talked about that a lot, though he didn't agree with much of what Spangler said about, you know, civilizational life theory of how they all inevitably collapse. Um, he definitely did have a wider worldview of like, OK, civilization, superpowers and the fight, whereas Buchanan was like less concerned with that, more concerned with the baseline questions of like, how does this help America? Will this promote, you know, American values and American and America um, geopolitically and domestically? Will this harm our significant allies? Will this advance our agenda like right now? in the world where we are. With that being said, right, like I think that the biggest divide I think that you can see between the two, and I think that that passage highlights it perfectly, is the uh, question of like first principles. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big criticisms that you'll hear from a lot of people when it comes to, to Machiavelli, right, is, is that um, you don't necessarily need a higher power to derive morality from. Um, where everyone is, or like having a, a set of moral principles or ideas of action without necessarily um, 
conceding to a, a, a philosophical or theological background, which a lot of people will criticize him for, right? Um, but like Kissinger very much doesn't necessarily advocate for a lot of first principles. Like we're, we're looking for areas of mutual interests. Um, we'll hear out the arguments, quite frankly, from the other side. Um, and to take a look from some like declassified stuff from the National Security Archive, right? Is that he listens quite closely to Cho and Lai's concerns about American forces in the Taiwan Strait. And, you know, Cho and Lai is like, we would like to eventually reclaim it. Um, we would like to see a withdrawal from American forces in this area and in the Taiwan Strait, um, just so we can, you know, for neutrality's sake, as we open relations. Um, and to which Kissinger says in these conversations, and I, I do want to read them if I can find the e exact quote here. The 20 is Google it, tabs you have open. Oh, I've got like 40. Oh. A lot of them are National Security Archives uh, stuff here, because there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, so Kissinger goes in response to Cho and Lai. He says, quote, as for the political future of Taiwan, we are not advocating for a two China solution or a one China, one Taiwan solution. As a student of history, one's prediction would have been that the political evolution is likely to be in the direction in which Prime Minister Cho and Lai indicated to me. But if we want to put relations between our two countries on a genuine basis of understanding, we must recognize each other's necessities. To which Cho and Lai says, well, what are the necessities? Uh, Kissinger continues, and I quote, uh, We should not be forced into any formal declarations in a brief period of time, which by themselves have no practical effect. However, we will not stand in the way of this basic ev evolution, once you and we have come to a basic understanding. That is all that I want to say now in a general way, but I would be glad to answer any questions, end quote. And so, really, we see this difference between th that, that first principles divide, right? Because, you know, Historically, I, I, I am inclined to buy into the argument about, you know, Taiwan has been a part of China for a very long time. And you will hear that consistently even in today's China discourse. Um, and I can see why, you know, that being an issue with America, essentially having China more or less in this security umbrella from the United States, because you have South Korea, you have American military forces in Vietnam to the south. Um, we have a growing relationship with Australia. And of course, we're at this time, you know, we still have forces in Japan, and we have a significant naval presence there. Um, so we're we're breathing down China's neck, so to speak. And so trying to normalize relations, Kissinger understands that, hey, this withdrawal and the consequences of said withdrawal are probably important. He does recognize the political backlash in that passage that I was quoting there, because he's like, we can't have a formal declaration of this. The president and the anti-communist right would eat him alive. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure Buchanan, and like that reference is exactly kind of what Buchanan's talking about from what you were reading there. So there's a lot to really break down between the two. And I, what I find so interesting is that there's a very practical and pragmatic way of looking at it, whereas Buchanan recognizes that there is also a moralistic first principles divide um, mm -hmm. when it comes to sort of the real politique. Right. And their disagreements go... All the, all the way um you know the, the very practical way of looking at it is, and 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 also the very like fundamental way of looking at it like they, they they have problems with the very baseline it's not some minute detail but it's like the motive behind why we do what we do or more so than even the way we do what we do um and we can like follow that all the way to modern modern history, or, or, or I guess I didn't say modern, modern history, but modern day, um, Buchanan was still taking snipes at Kissinger from, you know, Kissinger's golden throne up on the, the world. I think when, when Kissinger passed away, um, Kissinger's not dead. Kissinger's not dead. I thought, who was it that died the other month? That was Unless one I'm of the Bush. Absolutely wrong. No, he's still alive. No, no, not Kissinger. It, it was one of those guys. I thought it was Kissinger. That's my bad. No, D Donald Rumsfeld died. Not Donald long Rumsfeld ago. died. Yes. Okay. And we'll talk about him in a minute, because Donald Rumsfeld is responsible for um, sort of breaking away from the uh, American realist um, sort of Kissinger-esque foreign policy and the National Security Council's power. Yeah. Um. One of my uh, one of the commenters actually sent me the article. We'll talk about it in a minute. But yeah, uh, Kissinger's alive. He's a walking corpse. He's a what? He's about to turn a hundred in like in two years if he lives that long. Is he really? Yeah. He was born in twenty three. Wow. Yeah. He's a good dude. Old. 
So I think it's forgivable that I, I was mistaken here. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I for he's a walking died. corpse. You could pretty much say that he's dead. He's he's been dead inside for a long time. But he's still right. He's still riding at the Economist, and, and Buchanan's still taking snipes at him. Like, and, and with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, you kind of saw a change in both, not the fundamentals, but in their posture with Kissinger and, and Buchanan as Buchanan called for like a decreased presence on the world stage to kind of go back to the hermit country or not the hermit country, but this isolationist way of looking at things and, and operating that America had held on to so tightly until all the way to like Teddy or, you know, McKinley or something. Um, you know, Kissinger was like, well, now we need, we need to actually go out and expand even greater and, and to form a, a an alliance uh, and and Krauthammer was saying this too to form a, a an alliance with Eastern Europe and Japan or Western Europe and Japan and America and Canada and and have this like world government of of you know modern liberalism and that's like Fukuyama's end of history and everything and Kissinger was kind of more in that camp than he was in the um in the Buchanan camp but what what were you gonna say about Rumsfeld because I feel like that's probably more important. Oh, uh, so I, I was sent this lovely article um, earlier today, and I, I was I told him I was going to bring it up because I thought that it was really good. Um, he had sent me this article about Donald Rumsfeld. The uh, I think the t byline of it was, let me find it here real quick so I can pull it up for you. Um, uh, America's fell failed Machiavelli, and he's talking about Donald Rumsfeld. And one mm -hmm. of the first things that Donald Rumsfeld does very early in his career. Um, and this is from Edward Lutbeck, and we've mentioned him on this stream before. He is the he's the guy that coined the term geoeconomics. He is a uh, historian and a strategist, and he is well acquainted um, with uh, military history as well, to a point where a former chief of staff of the U.S. Air Force describes him as a hell of a lot smarter than Clausewitz, which <laughs> I, I think wow. is very high praise. Um oh, no. Yeah, but so he says this, um, November 4th, 1975 may have been my birthday, but it was also a Tuesday here. Um, hence, it was my day job as a consultant uh, to the in immediate office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, James Rodney Schlesinger, a three-room enclave in the Pentagon's outermost E-ring. E Absorbed in my own thoughts, I did not notice anything wrong until I heard someone controlling Schlesinger's secretary and confidant. Um, it turns out that Schlesinger had been dismissed by President Ford and Donald Rumsfeld was in. But one of the things that Donald Rumsfeld uh, does during his time there is, is that, um, and I'll write, and, and I quote from the article here, it was only later that I understood why Rumsfeld was such an uproarious mood. He had just pulled off the bureaucratic coup of the century. With the amiable President Ford at his front, as his front man, he had demoted Henry Kissinger to Secretary of State removing him from his more important job as the White House National Security Advisor. He had effectively hoisted Kissinger up on his own petard. It was Kin Kissinger himself who had shifted all of the power away from the State Department to the National Security Council. Um, and there's a lot there that talks about, because again, during the Nixon White House that we were talking about earlier, a lot of the uh, power is taken away from the State Department in conducting foreign policy. It's put almost exclusively on the National Security Council. And um, in turn, Rumsfeld notices this and turns it against him, um, yeah. especially because, I mean, wow. Gerald Ford is inheriting a very difficult political situation. I mean, it's the yeah, after no, it's Watergate, um, you know, and Gerald Ford is seen as this nice, safe, you know, conservative option in the wake of all the party politics in 1968, um, which is why eventually he gets picked to replace Agnew, right? Mm -hmm. um, Sadly. Yeah. But I mean, not like Agnew was any better. But we could, that's, oh, okay. we, we we could talk about Nixon all or the Nixon White House for or another stream. I might come onto your channel and do that. I'm, I admire Agnew. Okay, I, you know, I, he's, he, he's a mixed bag. Okay. Um, but yeah, so that, that's what the article talks about. And from there, like Rumsfeld plays a major role on American foreign policy from Ford all the way up to George W. Bush. So even his times out of government, right? He's very influential. He's incredibly wealthy. He's the CEO of a pharmaceutical company, um, lobbies a lot of aspects of government, and yeah. uh, gets back in. Uh, I guess you could w. say uh, he was a part of the cathedral. Um, 
You uh, could definitely uh, say he was a part of that apparatus. I think somebody asked earlier if he was like our guy, like if, like Kissinger. I don't think I think, I described I think he Kissinger. asked if he was the dark our dark lord. Yeah, I don't think I just descri- yeah, but that means like our guy still. I, no, I don't think it, I he's referring him. to Tony. The, the the dark lord thing isn't referring to AA's usage for Tony Blair. Right, I know. Yeah, it's I I. Okay, maybe I did misunderstand the question. I thought he was like, is this like the right wing equivalent of Tony Blair, not the American equivalent of Tony Blair? I mean, I, Kissinger's been a very, he's both loved and despised. I, I remember um, before Christopher Hitchens died, he was on tour on the press about his book about prosecuting Henry Kissinger as a war criminal, um, you know, from everything to Cambodia to the real politique and all the death that followed it during the Cold War and even afterwards from being the, you know, on the trilateral commission, being an advisor to almost every president and secretary of state afterward. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot there, uh, to talk about. And so, uh, what I find interesting though, about the article that my, um, my, uh, German friend here had sent to me is, is that even despite him being taken out of the national security council, uh, you know, his influence didn't wane. If anything, he was still used. I mean, even in 2016, right? Like Hillary Clinton consulted with him quite often on foreign policy issues mm-hmm. and was very close to him. So he's very much a um establishment guy so well, yeah speak. no i was just talking about how he was hanging out with donald trump um while he was in the white house well talking i mean he's only got you know 50 plus years of foreign policy experience exactly. i'd listen to the guy as well if, right well and and this is not an accident either i mean like i said kissinger started a publication in, in harvard which wasn't even read by the way he like kept the magazines in his closet didn't have a distribution plan or whatever he had a bunch of people write for it. That's where he met Buckley. That's where he met like future ambassadors to China, future ambassadors to Turkey. He met prime ministers from around the world. All these like that were like traveling into Harvard and all of this stuff. Like a dude had a dude had a knack for networking because he was a brown noser and his ability to just build everybody of importance up to make them think that he was like buddy, buddy with them. Um, but to like answer the question, He's not our guy, um, but I don't know if he is. I don't know if he's as pow- as powerful as. Well, I mean, he's, he hasn't gotten. I mean, for foreign policy, he is probably one of the most de facto schools of influence uh, of the American foreign policy establishment. That is without a doubt. But it's also important to note that Kissinger hasn't gotten everything right. Um during well yeah but especially right uh, he didn't predict that the soviet union would fall um in an interview with uh the council of foreign relations of all people he's interviewed by richard haas um who's written i think really only like one good book in my lifetime uh foreign policy begins at home that's like the one book i would recommend that you read other than that richard haas is very establishment foreign policy views the very sort of American primacy through interventionism and liberal hegemony, which Barry Posen and others in sort of the sphere will criticize. Um, but no, Kissinger had said, and I quote, uh, I would have, uh, I thought I would have seen the collapse of, a, of the satellite empire. I didn't think the Soviet Union would collapse or the Soviet system, but I thought that Eastern European countries within its satellite orbit would gradually edge out of the Soviet camp. But I thought that it would take much longer. Uh, when Bush 41 became president, he asked me what I thought the big event of his presidency would be. And I said the gradual disintegration of the satellite orbit over the next decade. I didn't think it would happen within a year. Yeah. Well, and Kissinger probably was correct about that, too, if it weren't for the attempted coup by the KGB, which really accelerated the collapse of the Soviet Union directly. So well, even, I mean, even then, even when he's wrong, I mean, is he like, like who could predict you know, maybe it wouldn't be that hard to predict the KGB, like, going against Gorbachev. But but still, like, he still, in a way, could have been very easily right. And that's probably the course that they were going on until, um, until you know, Gorbachev was put under house arrest in Crimea. Yeah, the reaction to Glass and Austin Paris to Yeah. Um, was a guy, so true. Uh, we're all looking at now at our guy tweets or messages in the comments. Um, but I mean, even today, right, both Kissinger and Buchanan are still writing long after, you know, the meeting with China, long after their times in the White House and their political careers, so to speak, are 
uh, have come to more or less their golden twilight years. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Buchanan has still more or less stayed the uh, the same in his principles throughout the time. I mean, so is Kissinger in terms of his realism and realpolitik of looking at things, um, both in a sort of pragmatic conciliatory fashion on how to ensure uh, American interests are achieved, not so much concerned with first principles. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think to me, the greatest irony for both of them, and I'll start with Buchanan, is, is that Buchanan gets shafted by uh, fellow Nixon lovers like um, Roger Stone and in coordination with Donald Trump during the 2000 election during his time as the Reform Party, um, only to later support Trump during 2016 and 2020. And then, I mean, Kissinger, of course, backing, you know, the, the establishment only now to sort of see a, you know, domestic and also I would say international reckoning against sort of the American interest pursuing foreign policy that we see, you know, that has been achieved primarily through what we would call now liberal hegemony. Yeah. That would be the irony, I think, of both of these well-known and famous American officials and statesmen. I don't know if you would agree. Well, ultimately, I think... Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think I think you're right. I, I think that Buchanan was always destined to like fell, unfortunately. Um, the legacy of Buchanan will certainly be failure in a way, whereas Kissinger's legacy will be one of megalomaniac megalomania and murder. Um, and not, not even to say that those are fair like legacies, but uh, I, I, I think that's. I think that's where it's at. I think Bolero uh, says it best in the chat where he says Kissinger loves America because it is powerful. Buchanan loves America because it is his. And I'm very much inclined to agree with that. Yeah, that's very well said. Um, that's, that's very well said. And, and it's, it's, and it feels certainly true. Um, and this is something that Kissinger like always struggled with. I, Kissinger was hella insecure. I can't believe we've gone this whole live stream without mentioning this. Oh but no, he, he he was known as a, like America's biggest paranoiac in the Nixon White House. Yeah, yeah. People talk about Nixon being like insecure, which he was, and and being uh, like super self conscious, which he was. Um, Kissinger it was super insecure his whole life about you know. You know, like you said, paranoia, like people positioning to take him out. And he cut off every single person in his office from seeing Nixon because he was afraid that they would. And he didn't like having meetings with large amounts of people um, because they, he was afraid that in the meetings they would form factions against him. Like all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, and a part of this comes from like his, uh, pr presumably, if you want to get Freudian with it, probably his childhood of being an immigrant from you know, Germany, uh, very smart immigrant, always looking for a place, but never really finding a place to fit in. And that's also probably true. Like Kissinger loves America because it's powerful. And and it's not necessarily his either. And it never will be, um, to, to be honest. And probably can't be. Whereas like Buchanan grew up in a Southern, like in Wash in Washington D.C. to a Catholic family with a Confederate tradition, um, and 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 yeah 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 or, yeah we can mention Kissinger's uh, heritage. I mean, there's a reason he had to leave Germany in the 30s. Um, it's like well, okay. I mean, if you're if we're going to talk about things that shaped him, right? Yeah, I think one of the most important things when you're referring to Kissinger is that his like closest friend or one of the, well, his close friends in terms of foreign policy realism is, is that he met Hans Morgenthau in college in back at Harvard. Um, and they've maintained, and they maintained a professional relationship that lasted for decades. Um, a lot of biographers that will tell you that um, Morgenthau was one of his greatest influences mm. in foreign policy. Um, but I think the biggest thing that shows why Kissinger is not as maybe principle or um conscious oriented about his beliefs is that he watched morgenthau get sacked by lbj um morgenthau was of course working with lbj in the um yeah in the administration in the mid 60s as a consultant 
Uh, Morgan Thau, from a realist perspective, could not stand the Vietnam War. Uh, he believed that it jeopardized America's status as a great power. I know that Morgan Thau said that, you know, this lengthy sort of military intervention is going to decrease our moral standing. It's going to affect our ability to conduct policy elsewhere. And Johnson had him sacked. Um, and I think that that really plays a much larger influence on Kissinger, not necessarily willing to stand up for any principles that he has because, you know, he wants to stay in there. He has ambitions. He's very paranoid that if he expresses his viewpoints that much like his friend, he's going to get fired. And we know that this man has clawed his way tooth and nail for political ambition and to have his voice heard in terms of uh, public influence. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not actually that familiar with um, his buddy in the, the Johnson administration, but I'm sure that. Well, that... so Hans Morgenthau is probably one of the most important foundational scholars for realism in the 20th century. Um, I think it's 48 that he wrote politics among nations, which is okay. really one of the most seminal books that anyone who wants to know about um, realism in uh, American foreign policy or just uh, na international relations in general, not just American foreign policy. But yeah, yeah I, I would highly recommend him. Interesting. Uh, and he's from, from Harvard too is when they met. Yeah, they met in Harvard. I mean, but he was uh, he, also like Kissinger. He was a, a German American. Did you, 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 uh, you did geopolitics in, in school, right? What, 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 I, I studied poli political science with a focus in international relations. So that's how anytime that we talk about theory on this channel or on this stream, it's usually from like my old college notes. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Uh, fascinating. Well, I, I think that you, do you have anything else you want to talk about? I mean, before we move on? Uh, oh, I mean, the question would be at that point is just, um, who, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I, I don't know. Like, I, I mean, we've seen the, these sort of two foreign policies play out on the political stage. There's always this call for, and I mean, really the, the internationalist perspective, right, that we see from Kissinger and others is definitely different from, I would say, the original American tradition that we see in Buchanan. Buchanan is often called like the old right, the paleocon. Um, and because that sort of isolationist tradition goes way before Buchanan. I, I mentioned earlier, Mark Twain. I mean, there's always been a, a quiet restraint of Americans about uh, engaging in foreign conflict abroad. Um, yeah. Really that doesn't, that I guess transition doesn't change until mckinley and then roosevelt and then you know wilson really expand wilson, yeah. well, well wilson metastasizes it but right. then fdr just gets on his limp knees and works for stalin throughout the war um and makes things worse but yeah that that war making the world safe for democracy um line from wilson which isn't even originally from wilson uh, which is even more scary um it, but yeah, there's that long-standing conservative American tradition that really goes back to the nation's founding. Um, that divide over about the French Revolution um, between like Jefferson, Hamilton, and Co. Uh, that tradition still exists today. It still exists today. Yeah. And you know, it's Buchanan's the American tradition has fallen out of favor, unfortunately, with most of the elite. Um, and that wasn't really the case entirely um, until 9-11. Well, I, probably earlier than that. Have you read the, the Samuel Francis article about why the American elite betrays its uh, nation and its people? No, no, I haven't. I'm gonna... uh, it's, on, it's on Skeptical Waves' channel. I highly recommend that you uh, give it a listen. Okay. But um, he sort of talks about just the... Because the, this is where... Like, this article came out in 2006. So this is long before... And unqualified reservations started. This is long before sort of the neo-reactionary crowd comes into the world play. But he's talking about like elite theory. He's talking about how the 1920s and 30s sees the demolishment or the, the demolition of the um, traditional American capitalist class elite, your Henry Ford types and so on, with this more internationalist uh, elite now that 
tries to be transnational and tries to be more of that liberal universalization. And from there, that's why we're seeing this uh, betrayal that we see between there, whether it's about immigration, whether it's about offshoring, it's a really good article. But I mean, the, the reason why I bring that up is because that is sort of this, what we, what we would call that globalist American tradition, while relatively young and new and about a century old, um, the original American tradition that you see out of the paleoconservative foreign policy viewpoint of Buchanan and those like him, uh, whether they're reactionary or um, just simple, you know, paleoconservatives. Um, that to me, that has always been the longstanding original political tradition of the United States and foreign affairs. We have been uh, blessed by whatever providence of God to have two oceans on our side and two relatively uh, decent relationships with our northern and southern neighbors, although the south can definitely be questioned. Um, but I mean, and so why be bothered? I mean, you got to, that's the old Anglo tradition of exit, right? Like you, yes. you left England, you left the old world. Why, uh, why be bothered with its affairs abroad? Um, right. Of course, you know, as the world has gotten smaller and interconnected, you kind of, that question gets raised a lot. How do you do that? How do you become more entrenched within your own country? And that's why I really talk about, um, Yes, you, know, you had this. You mentioned this on the Fed post, I believe. Yeah, I, I mentioned it on the Fed post about like you don't want collapse. You don't want to to simply yeah. set up your your commune, whether you're a leftist or a rightist. Um, because I have that realist perspective. Like the world is still going to be there, right? Like exactly. you can't you can't ignore it. I mean, I think like, there, there are because, ways. Just because there, you don't look at it, it yeah, you know, it doesn't mean it's not going to look at you. It's like when kids cover up their eyes and go, "You can't see me." It's like, well. Yeah, like you, there. <laughs> object permanence is still a thing, even in geopolitics, exactly. right? right. Um, and this is why I, I, I will always talk about things like there. And this is where I, this is the the, the series that I'm kind of working on, um, where I sort of talk about this alternate system, both in government but also foreign policy. Is that sure. I think that there, scholars. yeah, I, I'm, I'm working on it with some people because I want to have a really good system. Unlike where I just propose something out of the blue, I really want it to, want it thought out. But on the foreign policy side of it. I, I do have an idea for an alternate view of liberal hegemony. I and I'll be talking about it later this month when Prudent Reads make its makes its return. Um, I'll be with oh yeah, I'll be talking with Mister uh, Edgy Mandrill and we'll be talking about Barry Posen's oh. restraint. Well, I'm less excited now, <laughs> <laughs> Mandrill. No, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I think it's important to to just understand that you can't just turn your back on it but i do appreciate the american tradition of it though because yeah there, there's a difference between just in mindless intervention and then engaging in in diplomacy trade and things like that i that's a tradition i wish we could return to out of that meme return to tradition the, the buchananite yeah. tradition would be lovely yeah i mean the buchananite tradition with was the tradition that got us in 1812 the conflict with Britain because they were seizing our vessels and and also you know against the Barbary pirates and and there was still conflict because we understood the importance of standing up for ourselves and protecting our assets so that that certainly like this this super hyper isolationist worldview where everything should go and you know that, that's that's a that's a very hard reaction to the over interventionist side. And, and I don't think it's correct. I think that's where a lot of that comes from, which is this like extreme hatred for like seeing what America has done, uh, what the American empire across the world has done. But what I was referring to is like Patrick Buchanan was winning the argument. There was a, there was a, there was a, there was a fight post cold war. And when the cold war ended, there was a fight for what the future of America would be. You know, Jean uh, Kirk Patrick chimed in here. She said that like, America should probably return to tra that tradition, um, <laughs> and of of kind of being more isolationist and not not really, you know, there's no purpose. You know, it's, we can kind of go back now. And Buchanan was saying this, and and you got to remember Bush when he was elected was you know of the two of them, him and Al Gore, he was the least hawkish, um, which is you know funny to think about now um but he was the least hawkish he was you know, al gore and the bill clinton administration famously blew assad up they had sudan they are uh, uh, ethiopia or somalia my bad um you know the sudan conflict all, all of these things and libya sanctions um yemen sanctions i are forgetting so somalia i mentioned somalia i said ethiopia then i corrected myself and said oh somalia. okay um 
like so so there is there's intervention in the Clinton administration was extreme and, and Bush was actually viewed as the 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 one who kind of wanted to return to a hey let's not do this let's not do this as much as we've been doing this um and then 911 happened obviously and and like the kraut hammer view of well no we should have a global american empire really you know took hold um for whatever reason well, I mean, it goes before W gets into office as well, right? There's a long standing, and um, we'll go over this on Prudent Reads, uh, Mandrill and I will, but like the opening sections of the book, um, Posen talks about is like Soviet That's Union fault. Uh, it's called Restraint by Barry Posen. I highly recommend that you read it. I'm like halfway through it and I'm really enjoying it. But okay. um, he talks about how the Soviet Union falls, and you have this issue about what comes next for American foreign policy. And you get this real big push from what's called like American primacy advocates, which is sort of this discussion about, um, okay, we should have this sort of like liberal hege uh, hegemony. We should definitely ensure that the Russia can't sort of resurge anytime soon. We don't want another cold war putting out, you know, getting Eastern Europe under NATO and it's with the Western bloc. And that eventually wins out over sort of the Buchanan right. argument. Um, and so, I mean, George W. Bush, yes, he doesn't advocate for nation building, which is a really great irony um, pre 9-11 to what's happened now. Um, but the greater irony, right, is the 2004 election where both Kerry and George W. Bush, both shaped from their younger years by the Vietnam War, yep. trying their hardest not to make Iraq and Afghanistan their own Vietnam. And of course, we stay in Afghanistan now for almost 20 years to the day. Um which is, I mean, I think it shows the limitations, I think, that you can have of just expansion as well as interventionism. Um, however, I think the, the biggest divide at the end of the day to sort of wrap up our conversation on uh, Kissinger and Buchanan is, is that Buchanan recognizes the importance of your first principles, where you come from, that moral argument and the reputational perspective um, versus the concern of... Kissinger being far more pragmatic, amenable, willing to negotiate, um, which I think is definitely, I think, important to have both. Um, I mean, you need to have principles, but at the same time, um, I think that you you need to be willing to work pragmatically and realistically. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think that my realist bias will have me side with Kissinger oftentimes about how to negotiate and argue with individuals and see how things are going. Like right now, a lot of the realist scholars that I follow are like, hey, this whole ISIS-K versus the Taliban thing, even if it is sort of propagated by, you know, American actors, if we leave it alone, right, it's an inter-Afghan affair. Um, like just yeah. like you, you want the Taliban to win in this one, but of course, right in the Buchananite response to that would be like, you want the Taliban to win after like 20 years, they're a terrorist organization. They hate us. Like, how dare you go back on everything that's happened? So you're, you're seeing that play out in real time, this the divide happening once again. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it'll end anytime soon. Um, it, at least as long as that tradition is still alive for however long it may still be. I, I just, like I, like I mentioned earlier, you can't turn your back on the world, but there are definitely better ways of going about it. You got any final thoughts? Um, well, I figured we still have like 15 more minutes that we... We've got time. I was I was going to be showing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just sent an article in our chat, um, in the stream yard chat. Um, that's actually a Buchanan article writing about something Henry Kissinger said. And I want to read it like a quote. Um, sure. Henry Kessinger said that uh, just the other day, the world's democracies need to defend and sustain the Enlightenment values and safeguard the, guard the principles of the liberal world order. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Buchanan's calling him out on this. This is on, um, well, I mean, I guess you can get anywhere that Buchanan uh, publishes. Uh, and, and you can still see like this internationalist view versus this at home view and this, you know, this more isolationist view that we've been talking about. Um, it, it still permeates and it's still being discussed. And uh, Henry Kissinger is, is calling for a new system of, of, of or not a new system, but a, a, but a, a go back like the Atlantic Council, like NATO, to, to return to democratic processes that have been abandoned and uh, embrace liberalism and all of this, all of this stuff. So if there is any illusion that I admire Kissinger, not true just wanted to say that I, I think you know like he is despite his some correct uh, um 
policy decisions and, and convictions. I, I, th I think overall he's been a um, you know, force for negative, especially since he left the Nixon White House. I can't necessarily disagree to an extent, but I, I think the importance is, is that the American foreign policy establishment, while deviating from realism, needs a hearty return to it. And yes. uh, as we discussed off stream, um, we'll be doing a piece on that shortly for you guys. So I'll, I'll have it, something out for you all yeah, on it's realism in the future. How Kissinger can be a realist, but also be like a freaking neoliberal, you know, world Wait, order. There, there is, guy, you know, there is, there is liberal realism. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's what happens in the end. I mean, you have to understand that you're, the last 25 years of American foreign policy have been shaped by uh, neoconservatism, for sure. Yeah. Um, although now we're, we're seeing the narrative transition, and it's been slowly transitioning from like 2010 onward, as WikiLeaks has pointed out, like with Afghanistan. We, we transitioned to the narrative as soon as the war got really unpopular. We, uh, we, we moved towards, uh, you know, women's rights, the, the, the sympathy and emotional card, which had existed even before the invasion. Like there's a there's a great episode of Law and Order SVU in mm -hmm. 2000 before before 9 11 um, before um, all of this talking about you know honor killings and women's rights and stuff like that. Oh, so wow. I mean the the narrative has definitely been there, um, but I mean I think that's a that, that those are some good final thoughts about just the long standing consequences of there. Like we're <laughs> Buchanan is owed a massive apology to the Amer from the American people and the American good establishment. Decade. Uh, and definitely vindicated on um, almost everything. And then, but I mean, Kissinger's realism, of course, has been transmogrified into whatever this horrible beast is now. Yeah. Um, but with that, I am going to uh, put out um, this little, let me share my screen here real quick. Hold on a second. Because now we're going to get to everyone's favorite part of the show. So here we go. Um, so here is all of uh, David's stuff. If you're not following him, you should. Uh, David's putting some really good work on. I have his YouTube banner above and his video link in the description. But he also writes on Substack and he works with the uh, APU. So if you're still interested in sort of uh, traditional forms of political engagement. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Then uh, the APU guys seem to be doing the right thing. They're getting the uh, the good candidates out there and growing their online presence and helping their ground game. I'm just here for the frog. Yeah. Well, if you'd like to shill uh, what you do, go ahead. Oh, give your, oh, give yeah. your elevator speech. Uh, hi, my name's David. Uh, I make YouTube videos. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I talk about, you know, sociological things. I talk about politics. I talk about history. Uh, the APU stands for American Populist Union. I know how some of you guys feel about populism. Whatever. Um, that's a conversation I've been having uh, internally and externally as well. So I, I'll cover all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, elite theory, talking about uh, the managerial class, bureaucracy, how America can cope. You know, I have videos on woke capitalism and, and the generals, and I have videos on the, you know, the MIC and the woke MIC, uh, all sorts of stuff. On Substack, I'm working on some really in-depth um, exposés. Uh, so thank you, Mark Doppelganger. It's been a long time since I wrote anything on that, but I've been thinking about it more, and I wanna, I want to, um, I want to get further into that. I want to start writing more often again now that I'm kind of figuring things out here. So very cool. Thank you, Prude, for having me. Prudentialist, Prude. <laughs> Oh, I, I get called that all the time. It's no yeah, worries. I, I've accepted. I've accepted the nickname. It, it, the only downside of it is that I can't be spicy on Twitter, and that's okay. From the Vooters. <laughs> I don't know what that means. The Vooters of the platform. I used to be an electard, like uh, one of these like election analysis guys, and then I was like, oh, this is stupid. Let me stop doing this. <laughs> <laughs> But it gets views, man. It gets views. It'll get you attention. Uh, election Twitter is something else. Oh my gosh, bro! Just like the most like the 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 most rottenest hive of scum and villainy. I I mean, it's just the uh, the delightful autistic map guys. I they're so dumb. It's awesome. I love I love it though. I love it. Yeah. No, I'm friends with so many of them, but I I let them know that I hate them. All right. <laughs> on, to, uh, on to the frog. 
Yes. So, of course, let me uh, make sure that the music plays now. Music. Oh. So thank you to my friend Cyberpunk Internal Affairs. You can find him on Twitter for doing that music for me. I absolutely love it. And because we talked about China today, I thought that it would be ever so pertinent that this week's Frog of the Week was the Chinese edible frog, also known as the Taiwan bullfrog. Um, you can find it in mainland China, Hong Kong, Laos, Cambodia, Taiwan, and other parts of Southeast Asia. Of course, it gets its popular name as being a prominent uh, item that you can buy in any Chinese wet market. Apparently, they are quite the popular delicacy. Um, mating season ranges from springtime to early summer. Uh, so you'll usually see them around uh, this time. They'll usually have their tadpoles out and about. Um, they are, like most frogs, they are sexually dimorphic. So the female is always going to be larger than the male. So whenever you see that classic game of uh, leapfrog happening, it's usually the smaller one on top of its back. Uh, and you know what's happening there. Whoa, dude. So, yeah. Come on, man. My I know. We're, we're, we're being spicy. Um, but they typically prefer marshes and seasonally flooded lands, uh, you know, rice fields and things like that. But you will also see them in urban areas as well with uh, around irrigation trenches and things like that. Um, and, of course, they are particularly large frogs with various forms of coloration. As you can see on the bottom screen there, they can range from a uh, tannish light brown color to a very dark brown spotted yellow with a uh, yellow underbelly. With um, topish eyes, they are a insectivore. So they're typically along uh, in, inside of the marshes or on the wetlands uh, preying for insects that come low. So they'll strike from the bottom to the top. But they are a particularly large frog for their species. They can grow up to five inches in length. Wow. And that, my friend, is the Taiwanese bullfrog, a very popular meal in China. Despite how popular they are in wet markets, the uh, icon has them listed as of least concern, so they're not endangered at all. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> Prude has gone lewd. Man, I love your chat. Your chat is such a vibe. Oh, I know. They're they're I great. They're I, great I, I They're wonderful. Love community. Yeah, they're... Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. I've got some, I have some great people in chat and they're almost always familiar names. They're very loyal followers. I, I love my chat. They're great. So don't let you guys think otherwise chat. I'm watching you. Does it look brown and pudgy? <laughs> the Chinese will eat it. <laughs> that's funny. That is pretty, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Um, but on to that, uh, I'll probably just chill with you guys. David, you're welcome to stay on for a few more minutes and uh, just hang out, chill and chill. I'm hang um, so yes, uh, chilling and chilling. This is how I end all my streams. You really you got on. it. You really. I do. I, I'm working on it. I've got. How long have you had the music? Going. How long have you had the music? Uh, I think I've had it now for two or three streams. Um, I know that oh. Cyberpunk uh, gave it to me. I think about a month ago now. So I think I've had it for a month. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I I love it. And he also works, he's working with uh, Semiagog, so he's going to have a new uh, intro uh, soundbite as well. So Good, good. Yeah, he, he's growing. He's great. You um, should follow him on Twitter, Cyberpunk Internal Affairs. Yeah, I'll get him to, yeah. Who made your merch? Uh, I, I uh, had a, a guy in my uh, Telegram chat do the Frog of the Week merch. Okay, um, he also did the uh, Edmund Burke with the Pepe head. I absolutely love that one too. Oh, that one is so funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I've got. You can get that on a mug or on some socks. Really? Are you no, selling yeah. that too? Oh, awesome. I, I am. Let, that. Speaking of which, let me go just put that up as well. I like the Frog of the Week shirt. It's very wholesome. Um, yeah, no, but I yeah, gotta, that's what I had my coffee too. today on. Is my Frog of the Week mug, which you can see pictured right there. What do I? What I had a this girl I knew call this a feminine cup but this is what i drink my coffee out of today so she uh she humili humiliated me in front of all my friends but whatever <laughs> Freaking well weird. you you should get a very you know high tea mug and get one yeah. of the frog of the week mugs oh my gosh you're right i'm gonna do that i had a um i had a mug with jackson andrew jackson's face on it with the hope and change colors you know like the obama poster 
Mm-hmm. And then my, me and my buddy were throwing a Frisbee in the house, and we knocked it down and it broke. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Forge in the Ask, uh, Ashes loves me. Who do I love more, Chat or Frogs? I love Chat more. Oh, don't lie to them. <laughs> no, I, I, I do enjoy I, I enjoy Chat more. The, the Frogs are nice. It was funny because yesterday I was walking the dog when I got home, and uh, the there was a, a, a toad outside on by the light just because we have our garage door open. And we just have a screen door so we can let the air in. But uh, he's eating all there. And I'm like, oh, this is a different toad than the usual one I've taken pictures of. And uh, I, I was trying to take a picture of him, but he just simply pissed at me and ran away. He hissed at you? Oh, no, he honestly. pissed. No, he, oh, pissed, he all pissed all over the floor. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have that effect on women, too. It's okay. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I don't know why your cat, your chat's calling, someone in your chat's calling me a simp Tuesday. Uh, shut, shut the frick up. Not true. <laughs> Not true. You're simping for women. Shame. I'm simping for women. Yeah. Um, but Bolero sent a, a super chat for $9.99 uh, USD. Thank you so much. Just with a, a lovely super sticker of a, uh, a guy getting some sunglasses on him. So thank you, man. I appreciate it. Even if he had nothing to say there other than that lovely little sticker. I love it all. Um, but with that being said, with the uh, Frog of the Week mug, let me go share that instead. So hold on. Let me just remove this. Stop sharing. Let me go share a different screen. If you like the Frog of the Week mug and you love that picture there, well, let me just show you how on earth you can get a hold of it. So share screen. You can find it at Mr. Prude's uh, on Teespring, his wares. They're all right here. Yeah, Frog and Burke. You have uh, Edmund Burke telling you that you were warned about revolution. And then, of course, Frog of the Week on uh, shirts and mugs that can be shipped both to the EU countries and the United States. So even for my European... Even for my European subscribers, and I do have a lot of them, and I am very thankful for all of them, uh, you have access to them, whether you live in the UK, parts of the European Union, or here in the good old US of A. You ship so, to shit whole countries. I, I sure do. I ship everywhere. Do you ship your pants? No. Ha <laughs> classic. Uh, but yes, uh, like I call my uh, subscribe star, this is uh, the Frog Emporium. Um, but yeah, so you like I said, to Afghanistan. Oh, uh, I don't know. I haven't, I, my, my Taliban contacts haven't told me if I can ship there yet. Oh my gosh, dude. <laughs> I should start. I, I, I should really put myself on the FBI watch list and start tweeting at the Taliban and ask if I can ship my stuff over there. Yeah. It's crazy how uh, everybody's interacting with all the Taliban Twitter accounts. I'm just like, to I, me, I it just, it, it glows. Yeah, it's I don't so touch hard. it with a six foot pole, man. I, yeah, yeah, I oh know. no, I see people retweeting those memes and like interacting with them, and I'm like, no, man, you're on, you're on yeah. somebody's hit list. Yeah, but that's just because I'm a schizophrenic, uh, I don't know, person. So yeah, I'm a schizophrenic I, I, artist. So we hear voices. They all glow. They all glow. <laughs> all <of them> do. <laughs> The last thing I need is to have a bunch of surplus of this if a channel ever dies or something and it just gets sent to a bunch of like African countries. Like all of those like Super Bowl winner like t shirts for the losing team get like sent off to like Africa. Oh, that's funny. I didn't know that. I know. Oh, it is. There's great pictures of it. It's pretty funny. <laughs> There's great pictures of it. Yes. <laughs> Clap for us, American Global yeah. American Empire uh, testing ground. Amazing. Absolutely. Dance for us. Dance uh, for us. You can, you, the same can be said about Australia nowadays. Yeah, I guess you're right. I, in um, a different way, though. In a different way. Actually, oh, that's, yeah. that's a video I'm going to work on pretty soon. Here is um, the absolute state of the Anglosphere. It's like it's bad, man. It's bad. Uh, Tayunka mentions in chat that uh, unrelated, but I started reading the Death of the West yesterday. Well, there you go. Is that that's the Buchanan book, right? Death of the yeah, West. Yeah, that's that that's Buchanan's because Suicide of the West is Burnham's. Yeah, and then Suicide of a Superpower. And this is why I always get confused. Suicide of a Superpower is also Buchanan's. Death of the West is Buchanan's. And then Suicide of the West or whatever is Burnham's. Yeah. Burnham, been- right, Burnham wrote uh, Suicide of the West and then the Machiavellians. And Suicide of the West is much bigger than the Machiavellians, but it right. is so much more blackpilling. Well, because- then, well, I think actually, Prudentialist, you're wrong. Actually, it was Jonah Goldberg who wrote Suicide of the West, clearly the more academic of the two. Don't bet. Oh, please God. don't, please uh, don't bet. Please no, don't. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna cringe. <laughs> jo- I mean, I- jo- Jonah Goldberg at the dispatch formerly of the National Review when they got BTFO'd for being anti Trump. Yeah. <sighs> so ugly. 
I the physiognomy. I think I think who was it? I think it was um extra JCB on Twitter. Um, the the really awesome Mormon guy. He was just like, when you're young, physiognomy doesn't matter as much, but after you turn thirty, it's like a dead indicator for everything else. And I'm like, yeah, it's probably true. But yeah, Suicide of the West is utterly blackpilling because it takes place before. Like he wrote, he wrote it before the Civil Rights Act, and he was already talking about how screwed everything is. Yeah, um, I gotta I gotta defend myself real quick. I'm not friends with women. I specifically avoid women. Okay, we no, there's no like friendship with women. That's off limits. I'm now going to go through your tweet history and confirm that in a minute. Oh, and I mean, I, I'll I'll interact with someone. <laughs> like, that doesn't mean I'm friends with them. Just means I want to marry them one day. Come on, think about this stuff, man. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> along with the uh, merch store. If you would love to support this place a long time and you don't like uh, YouTube taking a large cut of everything, there is always um, Subscribestar. And let me put that up on screen so you can all see it. Because as I've mentioned before, I do not uh, really keep any of this money. All of the Subscribestar cash, all of the YouTube ad revenue, what little I get from it, um, all of it goes towards you know paying for you know medical bills, paying for my anti-rejection meds so I don't have to dip into my... Uh, daytime IRL job for things like that. Uh, so I'm really thankful for all of y'all's continued support, whether it's through Super Chats, YouTube memberships, the merch purchases, or even here. Um, I'm working on buying a, saving up for a new laptop as well, as well as some books for prudent reads in the future. Even though my reading list keeps growing longer and longer and longer, oh, it it's worth it. Stops, bro. It never stops. It never does. But um, at the same time, it's always important to uh, keep on learning because the day you stop learning is the day you're dead. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So it's again, kinda... I, I am very thankful for all of y'all's continued support. But the one thing that I will ask out of all of you more than you know any of the, the gibs that I'm so-called asking for is always going to be to just like and subscribe. And then, of course, most importantly is to share the stream. Um, the bigger that the channel grows, the bigger that the uh, Sunday stream grows, um, the more people get to hear about interesting international relations perspectives and the more people get to see the frog of the week, the real important thing. What's coming up next week for the Sunday stream? Uh, I believe next week is going to be talking about um, the foreign policy of uh, AMLO's administration down in Mexico. Mm, yes. And then hopefully after that, I'm going to have a subscribe star backer who lives in Japan sort of tell me about the state of Japanese foreign policy and politics since Shinzo Abe has stepped down as prime minister. So there's a lot of fun stuff going on as well. And then next Saturday on September 11th, I will be talking about sort of America from the last 20 years uh, on my Substack, stack, uh, Prudent Observations. So there's going to be a lot of stuff going on. Um, uh, lots of content in the, in, in the future for you all. But uh, with that being said, um, let's just see all how chat's doing for right now. Uh, let's see here. Da -da 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 -da. Chat is just coping and seething right now. <laughs> Uh, someone said, today I learned that Muhammad forbade killing frogs, declaring its croaking is praising God. Huh, I didn't know that. Well, talking, well, <laughs> maybe I should ship my stuff over there to Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, marriage proposals ought to be marriage commands. You're right. Um, Kazakhstan bridal kidnappings. Let's go bring it back. Bring it to America. Return to tradition. Let's, Return. let's not. Let's, let's <laughs> not. Uh... Both of my For sisters are married, so I'm good. I'm like I don't know. Fortunately, Ashes says I'm halfway through Clash of Civilizations. Yeah, so I it was a really good read, and I had uh, Angry Mandrill and David Carlson on for that stream of Prudent Reads. We talked about Clash of Civilizations. That I think a lot of that book still holds up today. You know, twenty yes. some odd years later, I, I I can't recommend that one enough. And we um, mentioned Huntington in this live stream too. He worked. Yes, for we Hungary did. And, um, yeah, and the because, Carter administration as well. Yeah, he worked in Carter's administration, which is so hard to believe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to think about how like different the American political system was 50 years ago. Just like, you know, someone that we consider a very based section of like American international relations worked for Jimmy Carter of all people. <laughs> yeah. Funny stuff. Um, uh, fortunately, Ashes asked me, could you have a section in the show where you share, ooh, hold on, the comment just passed me by, um, where you share frogs that the audience have seen during the week? Uh, that's actually a good idea. Um, I will do that. I will open up my uh, my YouTube email, and if you're interested in that, then you can email me pictures of frogs, or you can at me on Twitter at Mr. Prudentialist. I changed my Twitter handle. 
Um, but yeah, I like that idea. We should, if I don't have a frog of the week lined up, I will always do, uh, audience submissions. I like that a lot. Forge in the ashes. I hope you guys, I hope you guys travel a lot. <laughs> well, fortunately ashes lives in the UK and he has sent me pictures, um, of stuff that he's picked up as well. Hmm. And he also went to the event. So I, I love that. Oh, he went to the event. He did. Uh, RIP. <laughs> No, I'm just I uh, no. I, I would love. I, I would love. I would love to do something here in the U.S. I just oh, hate the yeah. fact that America is so big. Yeah, I'm completely disconnected from that. How'd that go? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, Forge in the ashes. If you want to tell us, by all means, go for it. Oh, Meanwhile, there, the, the, like the gentleman no... in chat who uh, created the Frog of the Week theme just messaged or just commented, "Prude, I'm photoshopping some frog merch into the Taliban guys right now." Oh god! Oh, let's go! I'm gonna see that on Telegram in a few minutes. That'll be fun. I see a lot of frogs. I don't. I moved to. A I city do. Now I'm sad. I do. I'm a I'm a bug who's living in a pod. Oh my yeah. my my sympathies for you, David. It's like we, uh, we, we switch. We switch positions. Like I used to be the country boy and then, you know, you lived in El Paso and now I'm living in a city and you're living in freaking country boy. Um, it, it is nice. I'm not going to lie. I've lived in cities most of my life. So that'll be, it's, it's nice to change. Um, well, Forge says that the event was based as could be, and he saw a lot of my fans at the event. Well, I'm very thankful for that. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday says if the event was held in the United States, AA would have to see MAGA turbans. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jay, I, I know that he did a review stream. I haven't had a chance to see it yet. I've been catching up on virtually everyone else's content, um, but that's on my list of things to watch. But yeah, no, I, I I still want to do some sort of meetup event thing here in the U.S. Although if I'm going to do it, it's happening in America or you know in, in the American uh, South. Excuse me. You know what we're doing uh, with APU uh, this December? We're having I don't know if we announced this yet. So exclusive. Um, we're having an event in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we should check that out. It's like 20 some odd hours. Well, that's doable. 20 hours from where you are? Uh, more or less. No, well, let's see. It takes about 12 to 13 hours from where I'm at to El Paso, and then maybe God, six Texas to eight hours to Phoenix. What the yeah, frick? almost 20 hours if you stop for gas and stuff. That's insane. That's a long time. Yeah. Uh, someone asks me, what is my favorite frog? Um, it's a good question. Thoughts on Yiz the Unix meet up in the woods? Sounds scary. <laughs> sound, sounds like a great way to get arrested by the feds. <laughs> sorry he is if you hear this but it just no, sounds like a really good way for the atf or somebody to just get the drop on you um i love, I love you she'll she'll do fine it'll be good i'm sure yeah but to answer your question trado 2015 i guess one of my i guess my some of my favorites i don't have like a definitive one but some of like i guess my top three would be uh the classic american bullfrog the whites uh green tree frog and then the um uh I think it's called the it's called the the pixie frog or the pixie bullfrog. Um, it's an it's an African frog. It's a it's a big boy. But those would be my top three. Yeah, how do you feel about them turning the freaking frogs gay? Dude? I'm very upset about it. In the same way that like they did those experiments on catfish, and apparently like they made the the catfish males like produce eggs, tells you a lot about the power of soy. <laughs> Uh, Neurocraft chat decided that Pepe was the best frog. I think it was like Don the Pleb and a few others that came in saying Pepe was the best best frog. Well, you can do some straw polls now on YouTube. Oh, yes, I can. I can put polls up. Well, I'll have to do that for one of these streams about like who is best frog. I love how us sitting here just sh shooting shit has more views than the rest of the stream. I know, it, it, but that always happens towards the end of the show. Once you do frog of the week, um, it, it just jumps up. Not to mention they just, that they come for the frogs. They they come for the frogs, which <laughs> I, I I was I was both loving that and complaining about it the other day. I think I was telling Mark uh, on Twitter doppelganger. I was just like, um, posts cute picture of frog with some comment like 125 likes. Does an in depth thread about uh, you know the importance of um, is that a dino? That's a Oh, it's a little plastic dinosaur. Look at that. Sure. But my other complaint was like, does a does a long um, thread about like the importance of diners as the central part of like American rural identity? Like twelve likes. I was just like, this is. I thought life. that was a good thread, by the way. I saw that thread. Oh, I'm, I'm probably going to do a video on it. I still I have a lot more to say on it. And uh, yeah. But yeah, also the other reason why the the viewership is up is because uh, 
Oren's stream just wrapped up as well. Oren. Freaking yeah. Oren. Phil Collins. That dude. Follow me back Cyber on Ninja Twitter. Zero, the, I'm, the I'm importance honored. of Frog. The importance of Frog. The importance of being uh, Ernest and Frog. I should just steal your bit and have like Dinosaur of the Week. <laughs> The same I, you way know, I, I would I would love that to be the case because that means I'm a trendsetter and I'm okay with that. The same way I stole uh, my, my YouTube banner is just a complete ripoff of Nathaniel Abbott's YouTube banner. I have no idea who that is. You don't know who the fan... Wow. No, no, not no. A real... Well, I mean, tell me. That way I can look up you're the not guy. A, you're not a real APU Chad like I thought you were. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm also not that much into Zoomer politics apparently either. Wow. No, he's just... A buddy of mine uh, who works with APU and um, John Doyle and myself. Well, I know I've been following John Doyle for, I think, two or three years now. I, I enjoy the heck off Kami. I have always enjoyed the the intro of the 1950s trad wife and husband. Look, your Chad is upset at you for not knowing who Nathaniel Abbott is. He's one of your guys, isn't he? Forge slash our guys, backslash yeah. forge. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, Daniel Chang asked me if I'll join them. I mean, I'll probably support them if they put, you know, good stuff out there. I mean, so far I'm not at all disappointed with the work that they're doing. Nathaniel is helping reestablish theocracy. Well, just a, just Guy's another ruined. hit, just another, just another hit piece for Clara Lemon and all those other people. Freaking Ben Lorber. About. This pedophile named Ben Lorber has been a, 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 a legend. Maybe. Alleged. That's yeah. Alleged. There you go. You don't want to get um, sued like Elon Musk. Yeah, this alleged freaking groomer has been like obsessing over a couple of our guys, like young people too. Like talking about sixteen-year-olds that are working with us. He's over here writing hit pieces about them. Like, come on, dude. Bro, uh, Carson, to answer your question, it stands for the American Populist Union. They're a new political organization helping more America First-based candidates. So they're not as uh paused or corrupted by the establishment who use america first whenever they want to yeah we, the event in arizona should I'm, i don't want to announce anything else no the good thing about apu is that most of the guys that work on it have no clue what we do on this side of the internet so they'll never see this but we're gonna have some pretty good people at that event and i'm very excited for it so um it's in arizona so you can just pick some guesses about the based people that are going to be there so um and daniel my only response about any sort of theocratic aspect of uh american politics is is that you're gonna have like a three or four way battle between evangelicals other prots catholics and ortho ortho bros all arguing about what kind well what's um, awesome is that there's it doesn't matter because like catholics and like mainline I, I, i'm an evangelical mainline protestantism is basically dead in the states so that that breaks my heart. Um, yeah, I mean it sucks, and and Orthodox isn't even that big of a faction. Um, yeah, but they, we all we all we all argue online, and I kind of this is the same reason why I want um and the, and the Mormons, of course, they're probably the most like yeah, the Mormons are the most. They stand organized. a chance. They stand yeah. a chance. Yeah, like out of all of the Christian, I mean, if we're gonna call Mormons Christian <laughs> uh, sects in America, the Mormons are the most capable of political action because they're they they're. Although BYU is getting paused and that breaks my heart. Are they really? I thought, okay, whatever. Yeah. Um, but no, uh, yeah, I saw, I, I, yeah, Peter Hitchens has been pretty adamant about the, the dangers of populism and he's had his criticisms about the Brexit campaign as well. I, I did love, up. I did love the other day that the, he retweeted raw egg nationalists meme, where it's Peter Hitchens, face with the two hands holding the gun. I'm gonna have to find it now. Cause it's so, so good. Let me stop sharing. This will be the last thing that I share. Um, well, while you're looking for that, go for it. Despite being in the American Populist Union, I too, as a base right winger, have my reservations about populism. But that's it. Yeah. But yeah, he retweeted freaking raw egg nationalist the other day. And I could not believe that this was a real retweet. Let me hope that he didn't take it down. If not, I'm going to have to find the screenshot. Because I took oh, a picture. I took a picture of it and I was like, this needs to be preserved in case it ever gets taken down. Um, oh, here it is. Perfect. Um, let me go <laughs> share my screen because this is just too good. Um, and this is a great way to, to end the, um, just to wrap up for today. Uh, here we go. Share. Uh, Cause my Twitter is going to be. Yeah. So share that. Cool. So this is this is what he retweeted. So raw egg nationalists, one of those like frog Twitter guys, or they wrote a book about like um, 
ways to eat raw eggs and to live healthier and to avoid like Xena, uh, you know, uh, all plant estrogens and stuff like that. But yeah, so if you don't follow uh, Peter Hitchens on Twitter, he's very adamant when you interact with him that it's Mr. Hitchens to you. You can't call him Peter. Um, and so this was this was the meme that Raw Egg Nationalist put out and Peter Hitchens retweeted it. So this is probably like the greatest moment for like right wing internet Twitter to have. It's Mr. Hitchens to you. I just enjoy it. Oh, someone's telling me to check Telegram. I will look at that once the stream ends and I'll reply because Lord knows that um, it's probably stuff I'm not wanting to share on the stream. To. All right. Well, it's time for me to get out of here. Um, thanks for having me. I already plugged my stuff. I appreciate it. Chat. And your channel link is in the description. So if they want to check out what you do, it's right down below in the description. Enjoy. Chat super hospitable. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Prudentialist, for having me. Good conversation. Hopefully, we'll no problem. Uh, hopefully, we will, and uh, I'll talk to you later, man. See you later. How See do ya. I get out of here? How do I get uh, out of here? I'll take care of that. Just say bye. Bye. There we go. He's out of here. Um, but with all that being said, ladies and gents, I'll wrap it up as well. I will see you all shortly in another video that will be coming out this week. Um, next week, we'll be talking about Mexico and the foreign policy of AMLO. And with all that being said, um, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Have a good evening, good night, or good morning. Be prudent, everybody, and take care.